Well, good morning. Happy week after Easter. Is that an appropriate expression to welcome everybody? Or maybe, you know what? Last week there's this thing, every time there's Easter, I say he is risen, and you say he is risen indeed. And I think he's as resurrected today as he was last week. So he is risen. risen If If you weren't here with us last week, it was an amazing, amazing Sunday here at South Sub Church. We had over 500 people worship with us here, and not even counting all the people online. So if you're watching online, um, we're watching you, okay? So I think there's over 60 or 70 people that joined us online, and I heard they were from over four or five different states. So if you're watching us online, thank you so much for joining us as well here. You know, it's hard to believe this is my only my second week here. It really feels like we have been here six months, even a year. Y'all have welcomed us so much. But last week, somebody stopped me and said, Keith, we've met your wife, and some of you have met my mother-in-law that lives with us, but what about the rest of your family? And so I thought it might be appropriate as we're starting off our journey of life together. Let me introduce to you um, my family. And, and I have to warn you, as you look at this picture, they're about to show up there. I asked my wife for a photograph. It took me three days because she's looking through hundreds of photographs to make sure we looked right. Isn't that the way you show photographs? So there's a picture of my family up there. It's actually about five years ago. My son got married. And so that's my beautiful daughter-in-law next to him, my daughter, Alex, next to her. So that's our family. So that's a snapshot of us. Now, here's what I know about snapshots. They don't tell the whole story, do they? Okay, there were so many more photographs, so many more pictures that we could have chose from that specific occasion. And I've learned this, that snapshots are nothing more than just a moment in time. Um, You know, people today, they will look through and look through many, many photographs trying to put the perfect one on social media so the whole world thinks they have their life together, right? But we all know there's a lot more bad photographs out there that's never shown than good photographs that makes grandma's photo albums, that makes social media. So let me show you another photograph, another snapshot from that day. That one right there sums it up. I'll get emotional. Guess when that was? My son looks at his wife walking down the aisle. And you look up there, and his heart is just going, it's outgoing right there. And so snapshots really do tell a picture. They don't tell the whole story, but they give us a glimpse of what's going on. And we're starting a brand new series today called Snapshots. And you guys have been in the book of Mark since January. We're going to continue in the book of Mark, and we're going to kind of jump around a little bit, and we're going to be looking at different snapshots in the life and the faith journey of people that come in contact with Jesus. Now, here's what we're going to learn. I'm going to warn you right now. These snapshots won't always tell the real story. In fact, what I really like about this series is that some of the snapshots of people's faith moments, they're not even the best moments in their life. But here's why I like that. Because it gives us a real picture of their lives. Not a picture that we measure something in the Bible when I can never, ever measure up to that. It gives us a picture, and I think God purposely does this within the Scripture. He gives us a picture of real people just like you and I, that we can look at them going, I'll never be like that, but God help my faith to be like their faith. And so we're starting this brand new series, and here's what we need to remember, that in mind and your faith, it is never picture perfect. It is simply a moment in the life of the journey that we're on with God developing our faith. And so if you have your Bible, the first snapshot we're going to look at today is found in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and it's in verse 30. As we get into it, and as I begin reading and telling you more about this particular snapshot, this particular moment in in this life of of people, you're going to recognize this picture probably really, really close. And here's what it says in Mark chapter 6. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour, and they told him all they had done and taught. And then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place, and let's rest a while. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore, and they got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, because the Bible says this, they were sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many, many things. And you can continue reading this account later on, but here's what happens next. Next. 
Jesus is teaching all afternoon. He's probably doing some miracles. The Bible lets us know there were over 5,000 people there, 5,000 men, which theologians think this, that if there were 5,000 men recorded in Scripture, there might have been close to 15 or 20,000 people there. You can't even imagine that many people, and Jesus is talking. And he's going on all day long teaching and healing and doing all these miracles. And the Bible says this in account, if you keep reading it, that finally in the afternoon, one of his disciples, a few of them kind of gathered up the, the courage to come up to him and said, hey, Jesus, um, we've been here a long time, okay? I think that people might be getting hungry. And you know there's not a McDonald's next door, and we can't send them over to Burger King. So, Jesus, don't you think we probably ought to send them home to get something to eat, to find something, because we don't know what to do here. So, Jesus, wouldn't that be a good idea? Now, I wonder this. If they were really talking about their concern for the people— or their concern for their own bellies. Because remember, the Scripture had told us this, that they had been on a ministry tour, they had been in doing their own thing for many days and weeks, and they came back, and they were all kind of tired. And so they said, Jesus, why don't you send them off to go get something to eat? And the Bible says this, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you go feed them. Wouldn't you like to be there at that moment, kind of take a snapshot, a snapshot of their disciples' face? I mean, Jesus looks at his few disciples going, no, you go feed them. And, you know, they don't want to disrespect the rabbi. They, they don't want to do anything to come against the teacher. But, you know, they had to kind of sit there, kind of glance an eye at somebody. Okay? They probably looked over at Matthew going, okay, Matthew, you are the tax collector. What do we do? You can go shake people. Can you get something from them? There's no food here. How do we feed them? And finally, one of them spoke up and said, Jesus, if we were to feed these people, it would take a year's worth of our wages to feed these people. And again, if you go back another a, a chapter before, when Jesus had sent them out for their ministry tour, he said, take this, you can wear sandals and you take a cane, don't take anything else with you. So it's not like they came back with all these loads of money, right, these bags of money. And so when Jesus told them to go feed them, they're like, well, Jesus, we don't, we don't have anybody. And finally, one of the disciples spoke up and said, well, um, I found this boy and he's got some fish and he's got some bread. He's got five loaves of bread, which is really like five rolls in our minds and two little fish sticks. And so that's all we can, that's all we can do. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, well, here's the deal. Go put them in groups. Go set them up and order them because we're going to feed them. Again, I want to take a snapshot of the disciples' faces. They're going, okay, five rolls, two fish sticks. You want us to go order 20,000 people and we're going to feed them. They're probably thinking, this is the moment not of Jesus' kingdom coming to true. This is the moment that chaos breaks out. Because how are you going to evenly break up five rolls and two fish and share with everybody and anybody even feeling like they were full bellies, right? And so the Bible says this, that the disciples did what Jesus said. They put them in order in groups of 50 and hundreds. They set them all up. And the Bible says that they brought the food to Jesus. And he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he handed it to his disciples and said, now go feed them. And the Bible lets us know that the disciples went out handing out the fish, and they went out handing out the bread, and they fed everybody. In fact, the Bible says this at the end of that passage, that when they fed everybody, everybody's bellies were full, they had 12 baskets of food left over. Now, I love this story. And you know why? Because it's a real-life snapshot of the disciples' faith that's not so perfect. And again, I like that because Jesus is giving us a story. Jesus' purpose that day was not to fill bellies. It was to grow the disciples' faith. And Jesus, being fully man and fully God, knew how the day would turn out. He knew the disciples wouldn't respond in faith. I mean, keep in mind, when they had just returned from their ministry tour, they had healed people just like Jesus. They had cast out demons just like Jesus did. They had taught with the power of Jesus. And they came back from this amazing ministry tour that they were doing. Yet in this moment, you couldn't even recognize the same faith they had to do those ministry things as they are right now trying to feed these people. It was not their best moment. Yet Jesus had orchestrated this whole entire day because he wanted a moment to take a snapshot and say, here's your faith today. But I'm not giving up on you today because this is what you look like. I have future snapshots in your future that I'm going to grow and develop your faith and to be the type of faith that God wants it in you. If you're taking notes on your outline, 
You might write this down for your main point. If you're there online watching us, you've got an outline there online. But here's what the main point says. Jesus don't expect, Jesus doesn't expect picture perfect faith, but he does desire to develop your faith beyond what it is today. Again, Jesus doesn't expect picture perfect faith, but he does desire to develop your faith beyond what it is today. Wow. Can we all just take a breath for a second? I mean, here we come to church, we put nice clothes on, we smile at everybody. We want many times people at church to think we have it all together. But the very Jesus that we come to worship does not expect us to have it all together. If you're here today, and maybe this is your first time to come, you're as new as I am around here, not just to this church. Maybe you're new to even kind of God and Christianity. Let me just kind of just let you breathe a little bit for yourself. God does not expect you to have your life together. The great thing about God is he steps into our life with us, and he takes a journey with us to take many snapshots of our life to one day be the faith that we want to one day be the faith that he desires for us, but there's not picture-perfect perfection that God is desiring and exclaiming and demanding today. And so as I think about the faith that God is trying to develop in his disciples, there's three things, three observations that I want to point out to you today. Here's the first one about faith, as it relates to the disciples 2,000 years ago, but as it relates to our life today. And the first um, observation that says this, faith requires actions that are uncomfortable. Faith requires actions that are uncomfortable. You know, it's interesting. Jesus brought his disciples to him. He knew his goal for that day was to develop their faith. And when they came and said, Jesus, we got nothing. We don't know how to feed these people. You would have thought he might have sat down because remember, he is, a, he is a smart individual. He is a wise individual. He understands everything. You would think that he would have sat the disciples down, told the people, hey, take a break for five minutes. I got to teach some very specific stuff to these disciples. And right there on the spot, he would have gave them a dissertation over what it means to have faith. You would have thought he gave them a lecture going, hey, guys, do you remember what you just did in the days past? Guys, can't you do it right now to have this kind of faith right now? But there was no dissertation. There was no lecture. There wasn't even a conversation. Look what he told him to do. Go do something. He looked at him in verse 37. He says, you go feed them. Verse 38, go and find out how much bread. Verse 39, have them sit down. Here's what I think is interesting. Jesus at this moment, he wants to develop their faith to be more than what it is at that moment. But rather than giving this mystical conversation, discussion of what faith should look like and how to believe in God, he said, I just need you to go do something. You see, he knew right then that his, their actions were necessary for their faith to be developed. So let's just all decide right now and agree right now. We can't divorce our actions from our faith. No matter how much we say we believe in God, if we don't have feet and hands behind how much we believe in God, it's not faith at all. In fact, the book of James says this in James chapter 2. The writer writes, do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observing you complacently sitting back as you had nothing or had something wonderful? That's just great. He says this, the demons do that, but what good does it do them to say they believe with no actions? He goes, use your heads. Do you suppose for one minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse in your hands? Maybe you know that verse from years of memorization of the NIV, faith without works is dead. And so as Jesus is trying to develop his disciples' faith, as he's wanting us to develop our faith today, understand this, actions are necessary. But faith is more than just completing actions, right? Right? If that's the case, I'd be the most faithful man in here because every day my wife tells me to take out the trash and I take out my trash. Every day my wife tells me, don't forget to brush your teeth before you leave the house, and I brush my teeth. Every day my wife has four or five things she tells me to do, and I'm a smart man. I do what my wife tells me to do. <laughs> so if it's just the things I do in the day, my actions that provides faith, then I would be the most faithful man in the world. But we need to understand that faith is more than just completing action steps, the to-do list for the day. Faith is trusting God to helping you do something unnatural. Let me say it again. Faith is actions, but it's also trusting God to help you do something unnatural. Perfect example, Noah. 
He's got the wood delivered to his house. And he's banging and building this ark, and there's not a drop in the sky. That's doing something unnatural, isn't it? He's having the faith that God told him to do it, so he's doing the actions that God said to do, even though it feels unnatural. I think about Moses. <laughs> he's got Pharaoh's army chasing him from behind. He's got mountains on both sides. He's got a million people that he's trying to lead to the promised land, and he's got nothing but a Red Sea in front of him. Don't you think when he took his sandals off and put his first big toe in the water, that was a very unnatural thing to do? But what did God do? Split the sea. I think about David, the little boy that picked up five smooth stones and went to fight the giant. That's unnatural. I think about a junior high student, not just in Bible times, but in today's times. I think about that junior high student that feels like God's calling him or her to go start a, start a Bible study before school starts in the morning. I'm thinking about that homeowner that it takes faith to do something unnatural and keep being nice to the person next door, the neighbor next door whose bar dog barks all night long. Uh, what about the spouse who chooses to remain committed in their marriage, even though the flicker of emotion and love seems like it left many, many months and even years ago? Or a parent who chooses to continue to love their child, grown child unconditionally, even when that child makes choices that goes against the very values that you tried to place in them. I think about the disciples that takes five pieces of bread and two fish and begin to feed over 5,000, maybe 20,000 people with only that amount of food. That's unnatural, isn't it? And so faith is definitely actions, but faith is about doing something that God calls us to do that seems so unnatural. I watched your new preacher last week online. You know, we posted online, and I thought, I'm gonna, everybody's talking about this new preacher at South Sub. I need to go check him out. Here's one thing I noticed about your new preacher. He is physically healthy. When I say healthy, I mean, there's lots of him, okay? <laughs> I looked online, and I'm so glad they say, you know, on camera, you, they put, camera puts 20, 10 pounds on you. We need new, pound, new cameras, because I think the cameras put 20 pounds on me last week when I watched me online. And so my wife, we not, we, she and I decided to do something about it, and we joined Weight Watchers. Okay, we rejoined. We'd done it for a while, lost some weight, got off of it. Anybody been there before? Now, I got to be honest with you. It's kind of embarrassing for me to say I joined Weight Watchers because I always think Weight Watchers is for my grandma, even though now I'm a grandparent, but I'm thinking it was for her. So if I ever talk about me being in Weight Watchers again, here's how I refer to it. My wife and I joined a gang, WW gang, okay? So we're trying to add a cool factor to this thing. So if you've done Weight Watchers, they're like, here's what you can eat. Here's your points for the day. That was the most unnatural thing I've done because you people have loved me so much. You've brought me many boxes of chocolate-covered Oreo cookies, okay? <laughs> and so those boxes are in my office. Those boxes of Oreo cookies are in my home. And so there's something unnatural about me and my new WW gang <laughs> not supposed to eat Oreo cookies and saying no to Oreo cookies. Are you with me? You see, when God calls us to do something, maybe not Weight Watchers, God's probably like booting me to do Weight Watchers, not calling me to do Weight Watchers. But God calls us to a step in action of faith, and it is going to be unnatural. It's as unnatural as trying to stop eating cookies when you're on a diet. But that's not the only observation I see in this faith journey, this faith development of the disciples. Here's the second one if you're taking, out, taking um, notes. Faith doesn't rely on my current resources. Let me say it again. Faith doesn't require, doesn't rely on my current resources. There's some of you sitting here right now going, man, I would exercise faith, but I got nothing to exercise it with. Like I've got no money. I've got no talent. I've got nothing. Here's what I want to let you know. The minute you practically figure out how to do something yourself, faith is no longer needed. Let me try that again. The moment you practically figure out how to do something yourself, faith is no longer needed. When we exercise faith, we are exercising in a way of using something that we don't currently have. A number of years ago when my kids were in elementary school and they were at that expensive stage. You know the expensive stage where they're eating more than they ever have? Their clothes are growing out, they're growing out of their clothes faster than they ever had before. We're in that expensive stage. And I was working at a church, and the church decided to do a capital campaign. So we were raising money for a special project. It was going to be a two-year capital campaign. And so, of course, like many churches do, our pastor got up there and said, we want you to all consider to giving beyond what you normally give to the church. Would you sacrificially give? 
And so Denise and I got home and we were talking about it. We were praying about it. We looked at our bank account. I, I got you. I need you to know there was nothing left over at the end of the month. Okay, we just hoped they could get through the pair of shoes before the next month. That's how it just, it was paycheck to paycheck. But we're like, okay, God, if you're asking us to step out on faith and to give something financially that we don't have, how much? And I'm going, okay, maybe he'll have us give $10 a week, $20 a week, something like that. And that would stretch us. That meant somebody wasn't going out to eat that week. And he gave the number to us, $300. I'm telling you, back then with those kids, that might as well have been a million dollars. But we're going, if, if faith is giving something that we don't have, that's an action step we need to take. Denise and I committed, going, okay, God, we're going to commit to giving $300 extra above our tithe every single month for the next two years. But God, if we're going to give it, you got to provide it. Okay, just like feeding the 5,000, if they were going to feed all those people with five loaves of bread and two fish, something miraculously would have to happen. So we're like, okay, God, we signed our little commitment card, and here we go. Two weeks after signing that commitment card, we got a letter from our mortgage company. It seems they had misfigured, and we were putting too much money into their escrow account to pay the taxes at the end of the year. And so, lo and behold, never happened before in our life, and probably will never happen again, they said, we're going to lower your monthly mortgage payment. Guess how much they lowered it by? $300. Like, wow. Every single month, God provided $300. We got to like month 23, and I'm like, Janice, do you realize this? God has blessed us with these $300. Next month, we finish paying for our commitment to this building fund, and then we have an extra $300 to our bank account. We got another letter from the mortgage company on month 24. <laughs> do you know what it says? We've reassessed your taxes. Guess what? It's going to cost you more money for your mortgage. And guess how much money it went up? $300. But here's what I'm getting at. As you and I think about like our faith, it's not using necessarily what we have. Many times God is asking us to do something with what we don't have. And we can use lots and lots of financial examples, right? But I think about this. The neighbor who has the barking dog, they're out of patience. And it could be God's going, I'm asking you to just have more patience and love on your neighbor in spite of the dog that you hate. I'm thinking about the, the young boy or girl in middle school that's trying to step out on faith and start the Bible study. They may be bankrupt of confidence. Can you imagine being 12 or 13 years old and going to your school and going, can I tell you about Jesus and the Bible? And so they may just be void of confidence. I'm thinking about the spouse, and maybe this is you here today. You're in a marriage, and you're going, my marriage is empty of emotion. My marriage is empty of affection. But yet God might be calling you today to take a step in something you don't have with no emotion, no affection, and still commit to saying, I still do. At obedience to the commitment that you made to God. Or that parent who's had the child walk away from the faith. And every time you have a family dinner, every time you get together, you want to say something, but here's what God might be calling you to do, to not say a word. Because isn't it true, many times if someone's not doing what we think they should be in the faith, we are full of words. But God may be saying, I need you to remove your words and just let your heart love them unconditionally and allow the Holy Spirit to draw them back to the Father. So as we think about our own relationship with God. As we think about our own faith journey, I know this, faith doesn't always rely on my current circumstance or my current currency. Here's the last one I want to point out to you. Faith is a journey, not a destination. This is what we're going to learn all in our snapshot series. Faith is a journey, not a destination. If it was a destination, we need to perfect our faith and take that picture and don't ever mess that picture up with our lives. But in this instance, as Jesus looked at his disciples, he was just taking them on a journey. In fact, let me read verse 42 and 43. This is the end of that, that whole segment that I told you about, or that, that I story told to you. This is what the Bible says. They all ate as much as they wanted, talking about the people as they passed the food out. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and a fish, and a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. The end. Story's over. Now, if I'm writing this story and I'm Jesus, there might be like verse 44 written in there. And it says, and they fed all the people and Jesus rolled his eyes really big. 
or, and they fed all the people, and Jesus let out a big sigh and said under his breath, do will my boys, the disciples, ever get it? You with me? That's not in the story. Jesus knew it was only a snapshot. Jesus knew there'd be other moments their faith could develop, but he didn't give up on them. This is the part I love about this story because this is the part that you and I are in this story. Sometimes I feel like as followers of Jesus, or even if you haven't even decided to follow Jesus yet, we live in such shame. We live in such regret that it's very difficult to imagine God actually using us tomorrow because of a decision I made yesterday. And church, here's what I want you to see. The Bible shows us that Jesus lives out for us. He looks at our lives and he goes, where you are today in your faith is not your final destination. Today is only a stepping stone, a piece of the journey for a bigger picture that God has for us. You know, as I think about today, there are some of us that live with regret. Some of us that live with, with just sadness and shame of what we've done. But, but you know another trap that we fall into in our faith? We just live complacent. My stories of my faith being stretched, my stories of my faith, of my resources giving to God when I don't have them, were yesterday's stories, and I've not put a new snapshot in the photo album of my faith in a long, long time. And God says to us today, if that is us going, it doesn't matter how long you followed him. It doesn't matter your chronological age. It doesn't matter who you are. God says this, I've got a better tomorrow for you than you just experienced today. I've got more faith for you to exert in your life tomorrow than you've ever thought about in your life or experienced in your life. That's where the intimacy with Jesus comes, is living our faith tomorrow, not just thinking about our faith from yesterday. And so as Jesus looked at these men and dealt with this, he just, the, the observation is faith is not a journey, or faith is a journey, not a destination. Now, you may be here going, okay, this sounds really great, but I don't know the next step, Keith. Okay, you just inspired me, you just encouraged me, but still this idea of stretching my faith, developing my faith, like I don't even know what the next step is. And so can I just take our last few minutes and give you two simple steps? And these steps are if you're here today and, and you don't even call yourself a Christian. You're just kind of kicking the tires of, of church and God and Christianity. These are still great steps you can take. If you've been following Jesus for 30, 40 years, these are still great steps to make sure our faith is developing into something bigger and better and greater tomorrow than it is today. So here's the first steps. First two steps. Now, do me a favor. At this point in the sermon, you're like, okay, this has been good. I'm kind of getting sleepy. What time do we get out of here? Would you look at your neighbor going, you need this? Okay? Okay, some of you said that with a lot more like, oh, than I thought. So let me just give you these two steps here, okay? Here's the first one. First step, how do you activate? How do you start developing your faith? Spend time with Jesus. As I read that passage to you, verse 31 said this, Jesus, let's go away by ourselves is what Jesus told his disciples. I don't care how long we've been trying to live this faith. We never outgrow this moment of just spending time with Jesus. And sometimes we do it out of rote, and that's okay. But what we're looking for is just sitting down with Jesus. I had a person walk up to me one time going, Keith, that sounds really good for you. You're a pastor. You get paid to do that. So I'm sure you and Jesus are like buds, right? But like, I don't know much about the Bible, and, and I'm learning about Jesus. How do you spend time with Jesus? Here's the easiest way. Just read the Bible. Okay, now the Bible is a big book. So most people when they first start reading the Bible start in Genesis and they get lost by Leviticus and never pick it up again, right? So if you're here today and you're going, okay, Keith, come on, baby steps, help me out here. How do I spend time with Jesus? Here's my specific instruction. Now there's many ways to do it, but here's my specific today instruction for you. Read the book of Mark. That's what we're working through in our, in our Snapshot series. The book of Mark is really just a bunch of stories about Jesus. So you're going like to get ahead of the preacher, and you're going to know the answer to some things before I ever get there as we work through this series. But the book of Mark is simply a person, Mark, who walked with Jesus, one of his disciples, and it's all of his accounts of all the stories of Jesus. Now, don't sit down and try to read all of Mark at one time. You can if you're a reader. I usually last maybe a chapter when I read the Bible in the morning. 
because by that point, my mind's thinking different things, but I'm trying to digest what I read. So could we all commit this week just to read a little bit of the book of Mark every single day? And here's what I know. That's like Jesus' conversation with you. That's him talking to you, and you'll be amazed just reading God's word, like how all of a sudden you're going, whoa, God, is this like, is that the pizza I ate last night, or are you trying to tell me something here? Okay? That's just simply how you spend time with God. Now, you might want to talk to God. You might want to pray with God. You can do it as you're dri- driving down the road. There's lots of ways to spend time with him, but just start by spending a little bit of time every day in his word. And I would just really encourage you right now in the season we're in to start in the book of Mark. Now, here's the second thing. Not only spend time with him, as you spend time with him, ask him this simple question, Jesus, what's one thing that you want me to do today? Jesus, what's one thing that you want me to do today? Now you're going to do that's weird. Okay, like I can see reading the Bible because I can hold it. I can get on my phone and I can see the Bible. But like Jesus is way up there somewhere. Like, is he going to talk to me? I think he will. Now, you may not hear a booming voice, but here's how Jesus talks to me most of the time. There's just a nudge in me. There's just a nudge when I'm standing in line at Starbucks and just something says, pay it forward. Step out on faith and just be nice to the person in front of you. So maybe this week God might speak to you to do something in faith. And remember, you're not solving the world's problems. Like it was big for the disciples to feed 20,000 people. I don't think God's going to have you go to the next Nuggets playoff game and take five pieces of bread and two fish going, hey, don't worry about the concession stand. Me and Jesus got to cover today, okay? That's probably not what's going to happen, okay? But he's going to show you something. Maybe he'll just simply nudge you this week and say, you know that coworker that you know is going through some difficult times at home? Take him to lunch. You know, oh God, I got so much work to do, and I don't really know that person that well, just barely. We're just like work associates, not really friends. God's going, it's going to be uncomfortable. Because we talked about that part of stepping out on faith is being uncomfortable. Or maybe God might nudge you, to, if you're a student, to start a Bible study at your school. Like, that's uncomfortable. And you're going, I don't even know how to, how, to, how to do a Bible study. Well, just start by asking a friend to maybe to do it with you and inviting a couple more friends. It's just a start. You know, other ideas. Maybe it's calling that person that you've not been in contact with. And when you think about them going, man, we used to have such a good relationship and we kind of got into argument. I'm not even sure what we got an argument about. But the silence that we've had is more, more difficult than even the argument that whatever it was that we fought about. Maybe God's nudging you, just going, hey, call them and just say, I've been thinking about you. (laughs) Maybe it is a marriage situation. Maybe what God's nudging you to do this week is just simply to look in the mirror, not even a conversation with the spouse. You're not there in faith yet, but to simply look in the mirror and say, God, I commit to still doing. Is that going to make you uncomfortable? Yeah, because it's probably something you don't want to say. Because you're probably thinking more about how to not commit and how to get out of the relationship than to stay committed. And God's going, will you trust me? Will you take what you don't have, the lack of affection, the lack of emotion, the lack of caring, the lack of connection in the marriage, and will you trust me and step out and use and give what you don't have to simply say, I trust you, God? Maybe you're here today. And this whole Jesus thing, like I said earlier, you're kicking the tires, you're checking it out, maybe you're watching online, and you're not even sure you would call yourself a follower of Jesus. Maybe today, your step of faith is to say simply, God, yes. I don't understand everything about you. I don't get all this faith stuff. I don't really even have faith. But today, God, with whatever I have, I simply say yes to you. And God will take that little tiny mustard seed of faith. And the Bible says when you say yes to Jesus, a relationship begins and it grows and grows and grows. And the snapshot that you see today of your faith will not be the same snapshot that God wants to see in month two, three, year one, two. God's going to grow us and God's going to develop us into being the followers of Jesus that he desires us to be. So my question is, what will be your step of faith this week? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for, God, thank you for your patience. 
And I can think back on my own life, and there are so many instances that you could have taken snapshots of my faith journey, and they were horrible. (laughs) They sure didn't make you look good, and they didn't make me look good either, Jesus. But you didn't land there. You didn't stop there, God. You and all of our lives are going, it's a journey, and you're about developing us. And so I pray, regardless of where we are in our journey today, that, Father, would you nudge us through your spirit to take the next step? That we will not just be people of tradition, we won't be people of knowledge, but we will be people of active living faith. And God, I pray that you would help us make an impact on the people around us, because you in us, through us, living out our faith. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.